Let me get this again. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. We are starting a new class today. Uh, it's always really exciting for me to launch a new class. We actually do this every week. Uh, no, uh, Mark's done a great job uh, in teaching Deuteronomy. It's been a really good study going through uh, a book that is sometimes underappreciated, understudied, uh, but then we it's kind of natural for us to next go on to Joshua because it continues the same narrative. Uh, Deuteronomy was a book of preparation and education in helping them to know what they needed to do, who they needed to be as a people, uh, the covenant that they had with God. And Joshua tells us more of that story as they actually go into the land. Uh, Joshua is a really fascinating book. I'm really excited to be teaching it, uh, and there's, there's going to be lots for us to learn in it. So we're going to do some introductory thoughts today on some of the background and purpose of the book, uh, just some general information to help us uh, be ready to really launch in. Uh, so you, there are books for this. Uh, if you don't have one yet, you can get one. I think there's still some in the back. Uh, and we'll be using that book to kind of give us our outline going forward. Uh, but again, mostly today, we're going off that first little introductory page along with some other thoughts that I've prepared for that. Uh, so the purpose of the book of Joshua, what is the book of Joshua? Uh, it is first a historical narrative. We see the Israelites on the cusp of receiving the promised land that God was giving to them. Uh, they're still out in the wilderness, but they're about to go in. And like I said, Deuteronomy gave us all that preparation, uh, all the education on what they were supposed to do. Joshua's going to tell us that story of how they actually get over into the promised land and how they conquer the people who are currently living there. Uh, the big change that's happening in the book of Joshua, or the beginning of the book of Joshua in particular, is that Moses has died. Moses was the deliverer, the lawgiver, he's the leader, and he's gone now. And that's a big moment. And many times throughout history, uh, movements and, and important events have changed radically because the man in charge died. That can really take the wind out of the sails of, of a lot of movements, a lot of nations. Uh, we've seen entire empires fall because the man died. Here, Moses has died, and the movement is not going to fail. It's going to continue on. Uh, and we see that uh, Joshua will take Moses' place as deliverer, leader, uh, and the, the general, so to speak, of getting them into the promised land. So that's a big gap to cross here, that Israel is in the wilderness without a leader, and by the end of the book of Joshua, they're inhabiting Canaan, and they have themselves more or less established. Uh, so this book is going to tell us that story of how all of that happens. The first half of the book is about the invasion and the military conquest of the land. This book is, uh, there is a lot of war in it. So we will be talking about uh, military conquests, battles, armies, uh, lots of things like that. The second half uh, had a lot of administrative sections to it, uh, so the pace will pick up a little bit because the chapters are a lot of lists of, of families and peoples and, and uh, different things like that. But there's still some important things there because it is about the settlement and establishment in the land. So we're going to be covering major events like the crossing of the Jordan River, uh, the conquest of Jericho, the failure and then success of the conquest of Ai. There's three major military campaigns in all, a central campaign, a southern campaign, and a northern campaign. We'll see something like 31 kings that are defeated over the course of these battles. And we'll see three cities that are completely destroyed and many others that are conquered. So it is a pretty amazing book and a lot packed in it in 24 chapters. Uh, that is kind of the historical part of this. Uh, 
But Joshua is not just a historical book. Uh, if you read Joshua only to see the history, only to see the story of Israel, then you might not notice all of its importance and all of why we care today. The history is interesting, uh, but we're a long way removed from it. Yet there are still lessons for us to learn. So one of the points made in that little introductory page in the workbook is that there's a portrait of redemption here. God had made them a promise. Uh, first, he made a promise to Abraham that there would be a great land, a great people, uh, and that later on there would be a way that the whole world is blessed through his descendants. And they kind of got a miniature version of that before. A PowerPoint can cooperate. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, they got a miniature version of that in Egypt, where they had land, land that was given to them in Egypt, uh, that they had, uh, had accumulated. Uh, the people grew, so they had quite a population. Uh, you look back, you know, Abraham, that's one family. Uh, by the time they're in Egypt, they can have a pretty substantial population. Uh, but of course, there are some major shortcomings to that miniature version of the promise in that it turned into slavery. It wasn't the <laughs> promised land, even if they had some land. It wasn't really theirs either. They're still under the control of Egypt. So Egypt was never going to be the real promise, uh, and it was something that they needed to be delivered from. And we already know that Moses was the deliverer. He was the one who brought them out of that land. We know the, the story of the ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, the defeat of Egypt, and Israel found their way into the wilderness uh, to wander, to be taught, to be given a covenant, and to be molded and shaped and prepared to go from a nation of slaves who had a somewhat shaky faith in God, to a nation of soldiers and covenant keepers who could go and take this promised land. So even though Moses was the deliverer, God does not skip a beat when Moses died. There is no pause, there is no uh, difficulty in God actually fulfilling this promise just because Moses has died. Uh, it, the, the torch is passed right to Joshua, and they're able to go in, even without the great leader, Moses. There is a funeral, uh, there is a time of mourning, but God's promise endures. In fact, the book of Joshua is bookended with funerals, and this is actually kind of an interesting way of looking at the book, that at the beginning we see Moses' funeral, and at the end, we see the funerals of Joshua, Eleazar, and, jo and uh, Joseph. And Joseph, of course, had died long before, but his bones were carried uh, to the Promised Land and buried there. So the, the point of this is the beginning, Moses' funeral is showing a transition to Joshua being leader. At the end of the book, these three men are buried in the Promised Land. So the fact that Joseph could finally be buried, as he had asked for in the Promised Land, the fact that Joshua and Eleazar are buried in the Promised Land and not outside it somewhere, is a testament to the fact that God fulfilled the promise. And so this is a greater and better version of what was given earlier, yet it also is a smaller and dimmer version of the redemption that is to come in the New Testament. So we have a lot of of, uh, that portrait of redemption now. Another thing mentioned in that, uh, that first introductory page is the typology that we see in, in the book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua is the new Moses. Uh, he, there's actually a lot of parallels. You can go through the, the story of Moses as deliverer and the story of Joshua as deliverer and see a lot of parallels in how they are chosen and sanctified and go through some very similar narrative arcs. But then, as we progress in the Bible, we see that Jesus becomes the new Moses, the new Joshua. He is the greatest deliverer, the greatest lawgiver. Uh, so there is a continued elevation as we go throughout the Bible, which is something that we see pretty commonly uh, through a lot of these, these types and shadows. Uh, but Joshua is, is conqueror and leader and deliverer, uh, and he's going to be a very central figure in this book. 
So that's some of the, the purpose of the book. Once you have those things in mind, you can learn the narrative, you can learn the portrait of redemption, you can learn the typology and making comparisons uh, to Jesus going forward and comparisons to Moses going backwards. Uh, did you have any thoughts you wanted to share uh, just on those topics? Just, uh, I just heard, heard, heard that Joshua conquered, you know, kings and lands, and uh, Jesus conquers men's hearts. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And it's funny because, you know, the, the Jews expected Jesus to come to conquer people's lands. Uh, but that was never the intent there. It's, it's a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual conquering. Yeah. Uh, when I was looking at the map, I was surprised to see that one, as they were going to go in, there's that one strip of land that was owned by the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that the Canaanites were by the sea, and I just didn't realize that they were also in that strip as they were going in. Yes, so uh, we'll talk some more about the Canaanites, because that's kind of an umbrella term for, uh, for some different peoples and, and some different groups there. But yeah, it is a little bit broader than uh, where we sometimes are led to believe. The land as a whole is called Canaan. Uh, the people who dwell in it are Canaanites, but they're not all exactly the same people. Uh, and which is why there's some different cities involved. Uh, this is also a long time ago, so remember that the whole world has not quite divided itself up into nations just yet. There are some, some real nations and empires, but there's also assorted groups of nomadic people and uh, assorted cities that are more or less independent. Uh, so we'll have some of that to deal with. So that's a good segue into that historical background. Uh, that would be good for us to talk about. Before I get into that, anything else you guys want to mention? Okay. Uh, Joshua, as a book, seems to have been written at least partially by Joshua himself. There's some indication of that toward the end of the book. Uh, that is something that is debated, uh, and it's at least clear that he couldn't have written all of it, mainly because the story of his death is told and his burial, so clearly somebody else was involved. That was possibly Eliezer, possibly Eleazar, uh, possibly some others. There's some different ideas out there about who wrote the book, uh, but uh, ultimately it's not that important for us. Uh, but the events of this book take place in uh, around the 1400s BC, or possibly the 1200s, depending on which date uh, you, you want to go with. Uh, but it's in that time period. And at that time, kind of what Kathy's alluding to there, you know, Canaan was a very fertile and prosperous land. It was under the general control of the Egyptian Empire, uh, kind of. It, it wasn't Egypt exactly, but Egypt did have some control over that land, uh, mainly in collecting taxes, mainly in, in just the influence in telling them here, pay us tribute and we'll leave you alone. And occasionally Egypt would come in and mediate disputes or, or, or wars between various cities. Uh, they had that influence because Egypt is just you know, to the southwest there and very powerful, very mighty. Uh, but what we see in the land are a series of powerful kings, a group of powerful kings who rule over these different cities. Uh, so they're not... It, there's not really a, a whole nation of Canaan exactly. It's a people who share a lot in common. They share some, some common ethnicities, uh, some common cultural traits, but they aren't necessarily uh, the same, like the same nation as we would think of it today. Uh, it's much more based on the cities and the strongholds found throughout the region. So different cities would have different kings, different princes. Uh, they, there would be military fortresses, essentially. And so sometimes the cities would be at war with each other. Uh, sometimes the, the people who live around those cities would kind of fall under the control of those kings because that's the dominant force in the area. Uh, and then you also have these groups of nomads that lived in various parts of Canaan. Uh, 
have a, yeah. in, on this map here, this is kind of a, a 3D reconstruction of the area. It kind of looks like a satellite map. Uh, I like this. This isn't all of Canaan. It's one part of it here. Uh, but it shows some of the elevation changes that you've got. Uh, so the Dead Sea, this is the Jordan River. Uh, you can see all the hills on this side and then down to the river valley and then back up to these high hills and slowly going back down into the coastal plain. That area has a lot of elevation change. Uh, and so at, at different parts of this land, different people live. So you have people up in the hills, people down in the valley, down in the plains. Uh, some of them nomadic people who uh, would be raising livestock, uh, just traveling from place to place. And then others, you can see some little cities, city there and there and there. Uh, some, some major cities that are uh, found in different parts of this land. And so that's what that looks like without an overlay. You can see that big elevation change. The Canaanites, as a people, worshipped a whole pantheon of gods. That's not really a historically appropriate word to use, pantheon, that's pretty Greek, but uh, they worshipped a, a bunch of gods. And you read about some of them in the Bible. The Bible mostly talks about Baal, uh, he, and there's good reason for that. He was a major god that they worshipped. But they had the god El, who was the old creator god. He was uh, depicted as an old man with gray hair sitting on a throne. Uh, actually, that's some of the cultural depiction we get sometimes of God, which I find pretty interesting. Uh, then his wife was Asherah. You, you read Asherah a little bit in the Bible. Uh, and, but they weren't as active as some of the other gods. Baal was the primary active god that they dealt with. And he was a warrior god. And these people uh, were very fond of Baal, worshipped him in many ways. We'll see that throughout history going forward, uh, the Israelites will worship Baal at different times and worship these other gods as well. Uh, but even though the Bible doesn't go into all of the different gods that are worshipped, uh, we have archaeological evidence that there were over 200 gods worshipped in this area at this time. Uh, they were not shy about creating new gods and worshipping them. They followed the same general pattern that many civilizations did, many peoples did. Uh, of, of dividing up nature, dividing up various personality traits uh, and parts of life, and attributing them to different gods. So a god of fertility, a god of grain, a god of war, a god of family, all these different things, and they worship them. But it's important to remember that this is not like a state religion. There's not really a state to push this religion. Uh, these are commonly worshipped gods across the area, and they're not that coordinated uh, to be one defined religion. So you say the Canaanite religion, that's not nearly as established as uh, the, some other religions that you might know. These people are often disconnected from each other, uh, and they just worship these gods uh, because they've... they've shared the knowledge of them, the idea of these gods, uh, but they, they all have their own little unique spin on it, and one group might worship one god a little bit more, uh, while another group worships a different god a little bit more, oftentimes depending on what was important to them or what the traditions were in that particular group. So that's what Israel is getting ready to go into, a, a whole... Uh, the land of people who worship lots and lots of idols. That should help make some of Deuteronomy make a lot of sense. How God routinely tells them, I am the Lord your God. You worship me and me alone. They've come out of Egypt, so they've seen what that pagan idolatrous worship looks like. And they're about to go into Canaan and face a lot more pagan idolatrous worship. And they need to remember, there is only one true God. You can only serve me. Let's go back to these maps for a second. I know these are going to be a little bit hard for you to read here. I don't expect you to be able to read the words on these maps, but this is the biggest that I can get them on here because they're vertical maps. 
but I want to point something out here that's going to be very interesting. This left map is the land that was promised to Israel. Uh, Numbers 34 uh, details the border of this land. All the, the place that God had promised to them. So uh, you see, you know, going this far south all the way up, here's the Dead Sea again. Uh, here's the Jordan River going up, up, up. Here is the Sea of, uh, well, the Sea of Galilee later on, uh, the end of Chinnereth uh, back then. And then way farther up through Lebanon, uh, past Tyre and Sidon, all these different places up there. So it's a very wide area. Uh, this area to the east is some of the other uh, land that they captured before they crossed the Jordan River, or, or uh, that, that they crossed, that they captured and they on the other side. And so that was an additional area that they conquered. This map here is a map of the military conquests and uh, basically just what I want you to see in this is these little arrows so this red arrow is the first central campaign when they cross the Jordan River and get Jericho and all that then you have the southern campaign there and then you have the northern campaign going up there what I want you to notice in comparing these two maps is the difference in zoom level on these. These are not zoomed in the same. Okay? So here is the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Genereth, Genereth, uh, a couple of her names there. And it's close to the top of this map. Here is the same sea there. Notice how much farther this map goes up than the Israelites ever got in their actual conquests. This is something that we have to address in the book of Joshua. The, the Israelites go and conquer a lot of the land, but not all of it. They never do get all the land that God promised to them. And that's something that needs to be addressed. We have to explore why that even happened. Uh, it is not a failure on God's part. God has given them everything that he promised. Israel does not take everything that God has given to them. And there's all sorts of fascinating lessons to go with that. Uh, but we will explore that some more when we get into some of the things with the Northern Campaign in particular. Uh, and the ripple effect of them not conquering all the land and all the people uh, will, will spread throughout all of Israel's history. It changes so much going forward. Uh, in that they, they've missed out on some of this land, and some of these people that are not conquered are a thorn in their side for generations to come. One other thing I wanted to mention about this map in particular, the land that is promised to Israel, and this is an issue that comes up some, in, in more modern times, is trying to use that uh, description in Numbers 34, of the land that's promised to Israel, as a way of deciding uh, the modern political battle in the Middle East today. Uh, you know that there's a conflict between Israel and Palestine. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, complicated things going on there that I'm not sure anybody knows the full extent of the conflict between those two groups. I think it's pretty irresponsible to try to use number 34 as a way of saying Israel has a right to this land. God has promised it to them, therefore the Palestinians should leave and the, Israelite, the, the Israelis should be able to stay and to have that land. Uh, that is overlooking a lot of what's happened since Numbers 34, and the fact that Israel did not go and take all this land, and the fact that God's covenant with Israel ended. So the land that is promised to them is not necessarily promised to them anymore. So I don't really want to wade into the whole like, political debate of what's going on in the Holy Land today. Um, and you can be a fan of Israel or uh, you believe that they have the rights to the land, believe that they are the, the morally superior ones, that's fine. It's not really a biblical issue. Uh, from anything that I can see in Scripture, from my understanding of how the covenants have progressed, how that covenant has ended, 
and the fact that this promise was never even fully realized because of Israel not going and taking that land for themselves. So, interesting to see this, and it will inform our study of Joshua and these conquests here. Not particularly useful if you're trying to unlock a solution to modern political debates and battles in the land of Israel today. Thoughts or questions on any of that so far? Yeah. Um, on your other map, I thought it was really interesting. When you look at it, you can see why the Israelites had to go so far east mm -hmm. into the land of Moab. Because I thought, well, I wonder why they went so far that way. But when you see the ruggedness of that, yeah. that kind of answers the question. Right. Uh, there's, there's a lot of hills going, you know, down this way too. Of course, Egypt is, you know, down here somewhere. It's farther down than the southwest. And part of the reason why they don't take the most direct route is, well, they're wandering in the wilderness as punishment from God. But you're onto something there too, Kathy. That it's not an accident that they end up coming over here. And this is the point about where they enter. We'll talk more about this uh, in the weeks to come. But they, they end up right about here on uh, the side of the Dead Sea, and they cross the Jordan River right there. And this is where that first military campaign takes place, this whole central area. Uh, but you're right, it would be a lot easier to, to cross there than to fight your way through all the hills going through there. Fair. Well, it was a design campaign. First of all, <clears throat> the Jordan River is flooding. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's impassable. Right. So think the people of Canaan. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing to do is to go across the Jordan River, which is the, which the people in the central area would not be would be totally unprepared because they're thinking there there's no way they can get to us. So they didn't get ready. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. went in there and they took out the center. Okay, which then allows them to go south mm -hmm. and then stop and then go back up and go north. So it was, a, it was actually a brilliant, brilliant thing, but it was also something that could not have done with, been done without God's help to right. stop that Jordan River from being a barrier. Yeah, the whole reason why that works is the surprise factor of crossing the Jordan River, which should be completely impassable. Uh, but again, the whole point is nothing is impossible with God. Uh, when God has said he's going to give them this land, he will give them this land. And they're going to go up fighting against some mighty people, people who uh, at times outnumber them, who are stronger than them, who are physically taller and stronger than they are. Uh, the fortified cities, you know, uh, Jericho is very early on in the whole story of Joshua, and Jericho is a huge turning point for the Israelites in realizing just how powerful they are when God is leading them. Uh, that God can overcome anything. So this is this is going to be a huge thing here. Yes. Do you know the size of this land? Mm. Um, you know, looking at it, to me it looks like it's about 200 miles in length. This is not the whole. The, this is just like one part of the land here. No, the, yeah. whole, the whole land of Israel. Yeah. Um, uh, it looked to me like it was just like 200 miles in length and about 80 miles wide, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, about I'm not 100 percent sure. And this little line here is supposed to be 30 miles, is what that says. So uh, you may not be completely far off there. Yeah. Um, I read that it was like 235. Okay. So really That's close to what you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. You know, not the largest area compared to some other nations in the world today. You know, I mean, we can see the map of, of modern Israel, which is going to be somewhat similar to this. It's not a large country. It, at the time, was an incredibly you know, prosperous and fertile area. Uh, and they, they were able to accomplish quite a bit with this land. It was a good land. It was to be theirs. Uh, not necessarily huge, but important to know, too, it could have been bigger if they had finished conquering the land. Right. Well, we tend to think that that area there is was back then the way it was, it is today, as far as being arid and everything. Mm 
But you have to remember that was 3,000 years ago, yeah. a lot closer to the flood mm -hmm. than, it is, than it is today, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot more vegetation and a lot more, it was just, it was entirely different yes. uh, land at the time. When you see, uh, say, the uh, pyramids at uh, Giza and the, and the Sphinx and everything, they're out there in the middle of a desert. Mm -hmm. Well, they are today, but not when they were built. Right. They were the, built in the middle of a very lush area. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, this, this area was, well, it, God called it the land of milk and honey, right? That's, they were excited to go into this land, a land of great <coughs> abundance, uh, and they're comparing it to Egypt, and as Barry has noted, you know, Egypt was even more prosperous and fertile then than they are today, that land was pretty different. The land of Canaan looked wonderful even to them having experienced seeing Egypt. I and mean, certainly, as you're going through the wilderness, it's going to seem wonderful. Uh, but there was a, a lot of prosperity to be had in this land. All those promises we saw in Deuteronomy uh, that Mark brought up for us and showed us uh, that they would have uh, great blessings from God, great abundance, that there would be uh, you know, generational wealth even passed on uh, in their families. This was possible because the land was a good land. It was very prosperous for them. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, the uh, last big thing I want to talk about in this overview class, is the fact that there's a lot of war in this book. We've already mentioned that. We understand there's a lot of war. Uh, and that's fine from a historical perspective. Uh, from a moral perspective, this book bothers a lot of people. There's a lot of killing, and not just killing of soldiers. There's the killing of, of families, of men, women, and children. There's the destruction of cities. And this is something commanded to the Israelites by God. We talked about this some in Deuteronomy already, because this was something uh, that they were commanded to do, and, and there's some difficulty there. But we're going to see it played out in Joshua, and it's kind of uncomfortable to read. Uh, I've got a quote here from a historian, John Bright, and he's being maybe a little bit sarcastic here, but the point was still made when he said, You simply cannot preach from this book, and you ought not to teach it to children. Shield our gentle ears from violence such as this. What does one do with the wholesale killing of the Canaanites mandated in Deuteronomy and carried out in Joshua? What are Christian readers to make of the God whom Joshua portrays, much less the book by that name? And that's something we've got to deal with in this, in this book, in this study. But there's a lot of killing, uh, and it is a bloody book. Uh, it is something that I have personally uh, had to debate with non-believers before. Uh, of pointing to a book like Joshua and saying, you think God is moral and God is good? Look at how he is, is commanding them to basically commit genocide, to go and to rout all these people and to destroy them. How can that God be good? There is a few things that we need to understand about this to put this in its context. Uh, yes, there is espionage and military battles and death and destruction here, uh, but there is a reason for it. And there are some serious things going on among the Canaanites that make this necessary and just. The first is that the Canaanites are the descendants of Ham, and they're in a land that was not given to them. God has, has scattered the people into different places, and this land was promised to Abraham, and was promised to the descendants of Shem, uh, not Shem, uh, of Seth, excuse me, and uh, the Canaanites have moved in. They're basically squatting in a land that is not theirs, and they've been here for a while. They've established themselves and made themselves quite comfortable, but it is still not their land. Uh, the, the descendants of Abraham, the descendants of Seth, have been uh, temporarily waylaid in that they, they've gone off into Egypt, uh, they're in this other place, but that is still a land that is promised to them. And so God is leading them back to the place that is already supposed to be theirs. 
There's also the fact that these Canaanites were idolatrous and very evil. And God has the right to judge peoples and nations. And sometimes we, it depends how we frame this, right? If we look at the story of Joshua saying, the Israelites want this land, they're coveting this land, they're going to go in and kill all the people, and they're going to blame it all on their God. Well, that doesn't look very moral. But if we instead look at it with the appropriate uh, context that this is God executing his judgment, and he is using his people to do it, well, now it starts to look different. Now this is not the unholy actions of a people who blame it on their God. This is something more akin to God judging Sodom and Gomorrah and destroying them with fire and brimstone. God just using a different tool to do that here. Yes, this is violent. This is awful. This is a hard thing to read and a hard thing for us to swallow. Uh, and the fact that being done at the hands of the Israelites uh, is a little troubling. But it is also just because when God sees evil, he is patient with people for a long time. Uh, he, he urges us to come back, but then he also has the right and obligation to judge and to make all things right. Sure. Well, people today tend to look at that and think that and assume that the Canaanites were like everybody else mm -hmm. in their practices and their lives and everything, and, they, and they're sort of innocent. Yeah. But, the, but some of these Canaanite nations would take their babies and kill them and put sacrifice them, put them in the foundations of everything they built. This conquest saved millions of lives over the years. And innocent lives. Mm -hmm. And so it, there's nothing unjust about it at all. Right. They deserved to be wiped out because of their abominable practices of killing their babies. Yes. And uh, when you understand it in that form and you realize all the millions of lives that would be saved, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this innocent babies, and it looks entirely different. Yeah. Uh, there was serious uh, sin being worked in these nations, uh, great evil happening. And we see that this is what God does. He, he needs to judge evil. He needs to judge sin. Even his own people aren't above it. You fast forward in history and you get to Jerusalem being destroyed, to the people being taken away in captivity, to uh, them being uh, killed and, and having all sorts of, of judgment happening to them because of their sin, uh, because of some of the same things that, that the earlier generations judged Canaan for. Uh, so this is the way that God works. He judges sin. He brings that, uh, that death and destruction upon those who are stubborn in their refusal to obey. Yeah? And then we With the amount of babies being killed in this country, that's a pretty sobering thought. It is. And God does judge nations and peoples. And even if you, know, if you as an individual are guiltless and are going to you know, still be justified by God in the end, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not caught up in the judgment against a nation, which is why we become very thankful for the preserving effect of God's people uh, in a nation that he, he sees us and he delays punishment against the nation uh, in, in the hope of our influence. Very important thing that we do. Leader? Yeah, one thing I, I, I'm finding in this study of Joshua, actually, is that Being, we are being reminded of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, where in, uh, God in all the times, in the ancient times, spoke through the prophets. Yeah. And in here, I find it as the first thing to the majority of God's intervention in everything. And without that intervention. Yeah. Absolutely. Scott? Um, with Cain and being kind of like a representative of sin, you know, and God judging that, or 
but that needing to be out of the land mm -hmm. so that Israel can go in and be pure and be a, a people after God's heart and, a, and an image of God. Mm -hmm. um, if we if we always look at the spiritual side of this and see that that it, you know there's an ugliness to sin, and then it's violent to get rid of it too. Mm -hmm. You know, even in our own lives, it's uh, uh, we have to we have to destroy the sin in our lives and we can't make all these excuses like they made to leave those yeah. of sin all around mm -hmm. and how it affected them. They were supposed to be the image of God. They ended up being the image of Canaan in the end. Um, and so that kind of explains some of that too of the importance of, of the annihilation of the sin. Right. And so it's, you know, the people are used as that image and that's, yeah. it's, it's just a bigger picture than, than just what's happening with Israel because we're not now we are a spiritual Israel so we get to see you know in order to enter our promised land mm -hmm. we've got to do some conquering and that's you know or, or allow God to <laughs> or, or go along with yeah. God in that conquering however yeah. you want to look at that but that's just a, always a neat image to have in your mind about yeah. that whole message yeah, there, there's a purification of the, the people in the land that's happening here. Even in the war, that was necessary. Uh, the, the war is called a, a harem war, A-G-R-E-M, uh, which means something devoted irrevocably to God. Uh, that it is given to God. These people in this land are devoted to destruction. This is God executing his justice. Uh, he has spoken. They are to be judged. And... Israel is used as the tool in God's hand so that they would learn and so that they can, can uh, grow in their faith in God and their covenant with God. But it is important for us to note that throughout this book and later on when in the Bible when this is uh, recalled, that the killing is not glamorized or glorified. It's, it's never celebrated. It's a sober execution of judgment from God. Much the same way that there's no part of the Bible that looks back at Sodom and Gomorrah in a, a gleeful kind of way. Like that's, it was just, but it was incredibly serious and sobering. That's what this is, too. And historically, that's not really the way that nations celebrate their, their military conquests, right? We, we glorify them. We, we celebrate them. Uh, here, this is so serious, it's not really a matter to celebrate. The people have to sanctify themselves before battles. They, the plunder is given to God. It's God who declares the war. Uh, this is all emblematic of something that is led and decided by God rather than by the people. One final note, there were exceptions. People who were spared because they still respected Yahweh. Uh, Rahab and her family are an example. The Gibeonites are an example. This shows us that God was willing to spare those who would still respect him and who would not teach his people to be idolatrous. Uh, the fact that there was so much killing is because there was so much evil. Uh, that's how far this, this whole area had gone. Thank you, everybody. Next week, we will go into Joshua 1, and uh, we will go through that first lesson that's there. I'm uh, really excited for this new class. If you don't want a book, you can put your back there.